Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you, Brian. And just to start off, I have no disclosures and as disclaimer, I don't represent HRSA and any trade brand names for training identification purposes only. As Brian said, we're going to be talking about sort of a practical approach to polypharmacy today. And in leaving here, I really hope that you can have a better understanding of why polypharmacy is important and why we're talking about it, its impact on morbidity and mortality. But I think more importantly is being able to take what we talk about and create a framework for a for addressing polypharmacy and just sort of medication lists in general. As a pharmacist, I come at things with a different perspective than uh, medical providers. So I, I think having some shared perspectives is always healthy. And then the, the takeaway is, is really when you have a patient that has polypharmacy is approaches that you can use to simplify a medication list, either through medication reconciliation or deprescribing, which will be sort of two concepts we talk about. But before we sort of set the table, I just want to talk about a case. This is you know a case that would be not uncommon for us to have in our clinic. 55-year-old, living with HIV for 20-plus years, very well controlled, on a first-line regimen, adherence is really good, and has been stable for years. But the patient comes in for a six-month checkup, and upon review of systems, states that over the last six months has been foggy and dizzy over the last six months, but hasn't had any falls. You look through his chart, you notice that he's co-managed by pain management, nephrology, gastroenterology, and then you get to the medication list and it looks something like this. And then you can see from the medication list, and I'm not going to read it to you and go through it all, but general classes of medications that you can start to see that they have. He's on a couple of pain-related medications, uh, multiple cardiovascular medications, blood pressure medications, something for osteoporosis, something for a stomach, such as reflux or ulcers, and just some odds and ends. And then, you know, has a problem list about 10, 12 deep, which is not uncommon, as well as in a lot of our patients. So as we think about this case, there's a few things that begin to creep into my mind that are relevant to this talk is, is first of all, what is this word polypharmacy and does the patient meet criteria for it? And does it even really matter? And then the second part of this is what health risks does polypharmacy really contribute to? And, uh, and again, taking that information helps, I think, provide some perspective for uh, patients when we talk about this third step is reducing the burden of polypharmacy through medication simplification, through deprescribing, through medication reconciliation, all of that. So think about these concepts as we as we dive into this. And, and, the, and really, the, the first question is, why does this matter? Why are, we, why are we talking about it? And as we look at a little bit of the background, the first thing I want to mention is that prescribing medicine is a skill. It's a skill that needs to be taught to medical students, PA students, and P students, and really developed through residency and out in practice, and it needs to be updated. 20 years ago, you know, we were still writing paper prescriptions. You could walk into a pharmacy and write a prescription on a napkin, and as long as it had all the legal parts, you could you could fill it. I mean, it's but nowadays writing prescriptions and prescribing medicine and everything that goes along with it really needs to be taken seriously as a skill. But furthermore, in regards to polypharmacy, we know that the medications have great potential for benefit, and that's why we use them. But the other side of that coin really needs to be identified that there is harm associated with these medications, and we need to respect that. And then when we look at uh, medication use in older adults, we know that nearly 85% use at least one chronic medication and a little over a third take five or more medications, including OTCs and herbals. And polypharmacy really is one of the strongest predictors of adverse drug events, such as falls, hospitalizations, and death. And as we look specifically at persons with HIV, we know that polypharmacy has been associated with slower gait speed, recurrent falls, 
And because persons with HIV have higher rates of frailty, osteoporosis, other chronic conditions compared to non-HIV infected persons, polypharmacy be can become a more significant issue, can become a greater risk. And recent data actually suggests that if you can remove anticholinergic medications and sedating medications from patients with HIV's medication list, you can actually lower their frailty score or improve their frailty score. So that data does exist. And as we're continuing to set the table here, really polypharmacy, there's, there's probably 20 different definitions out there of polypharmacy, but the generally accepted one is the regular use of five or more medications on a daily basis. And to bring the pharmacist perspective in, when, when, pharmacy, when pharmacists approach medication list, we think about it from a medication diagnostic approach. And that approach it used to be referred to as identifying medication-related problems. The more accepted term now is sort of medication therapy problems. So when we look at a drug list or we look at a specific drug, we're identifying, is there an indication for this drug? Is it the appropriate dose? Does it need to be adjusted because of hepatic or renal insufficiency? Is there a drug interaction? So these are all medication therapy problems that we get into. And there's a framework that is established to help you identify and address medication problems. And then something I think we're all aware of is the prescribing cascade. And this is a slippery slope that we get into in medicine where a uh, medication is started for a condition, there's an adverse effect. That adverse effect is misinterpreted as a new medical problem. And then a medication is started for that problem and so forth and so on. And an example of this, and there are lots of different cascades out there, but for example, a patient starts an NSAID for arthritis. Regular use of that NSAID may increase blood pressure. Patient starts a calcium channel blocker for that hypertension. Then they get ankle swelling, start a diuretic, and so forth and so on. So you can see that because patient has one problem, that they may end up on multiple medications. And identifying, you know, getting into that cascade and getting out of that cascade is important. The big question now is what can we do about it? And I think the before we start talking about deprescribing, is, is talking about appropriate prescribing. And who sets out these sort of good steps to follow uh, this framework, if you will? And, and I know this is probably very common sense, but I think there's some important points to take away from these steps. So defining the patient's problem. Obviously, you know, having a solid diagnosis is important, but sometimes a patient comes with some abdominal pain. We don't know if it's GERD. They get started on an anti-reflux medication, and then they stay on it. So really identifying that patient's problem and having a specific therapeutic objective. I teach a lot of my students I work with in residence that unless you have a specific outcome and a therapeutic objective, do not start prescribing medication. And making the patient aware of this is the reason why you're taking the medication. Then once you choose your treatment, is verifying that suitability, and this is an old family medicine acronym, steps, identifying the safety, tolerability, efficacy, and price. So you may have done everything perfect up until this point, but if the patient can't afford their medication, then they're not going to take it. And if they're not taking it, but you think that they are and they're not improving, that may wind up being on more medication. Starting treatment, going over instructions, and then the last step, that monitoring. And the part that gets left out a lot is stopping treatment. At what point are we going to discontinue this? And you know, Sam Jackson talked about this a lot over the last few weeks with mental health is at what point should we be stopping a medication for a condition? And, uh, and so that the patient knows, are they going to be on it for three months, six months, 12, so forth. So in stopping medication, again, let's think about it on the other side of that hill, deprescribing. There is strong evidence that deprescribing of medications improves overall health, helps with reducing falls, cognitive impairment, adverse effects, reduces costs, and generally improves overall quality of life. But really, it's identifying the appropriate medications to be deprescribed. And when we look at patient populations that are important, the first ones that come to mind are patients that express polypharmacy, multimorbidity, renal impairment, multiple prescribers. And the patient I used in the case, a patient of ours, had all four of those. And other patients that may show up on your roster, your panel, would be those 
with a history of non-adherence, limited life expectancy, dementia, or those in transitions of care. Then there are certain medications that have been identified that you should target for deprescribing. And uh, these first two, the BEERS criteria and the STOP START medication list, uh, I'll get into in just a couple slides, but these are sets of medications that have been identified by uh, different societies, BEERS criteria is the American Geriatric Society, of medications that carry high risk of morbidity and mortality, primarily in older adults. But there are general medications and also what we refer to as legacy medications. So you inherit a patient that comes to you on a proton pump inhibitor, for example, and you're at the end of your visit and you're like, oh, okay, we'll just get you another 12 months of your proton pump inhibitor. Those are things that really should be checked and said, okay, do we really need this? What's the diagnosis? So forth and so on. Other medications, non-steroidals, anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, any CNS drug, that may cause dizziness, uh, risk of falls, any of those should be explored. And the BEERS criteria and the STOP STAR are very, very thorough. So as part of the deep prescribing process, just to look at it in a, again, a sort of a framework, that first step is really a medication reconciliation, is reviewing all of those medications. I know a lot of times nursing goes through medication reconciliation, but it's important, I feel, for prescribers to, to get into that medication list as well. And really look at that legacy prescribing. Are you just re-upping medications um, because the patient's been on them for years without an indication or has not been tried off of them? Then sort of getting into that shared decision-making process about de-prescribing. You know, is the, does the patient have a fear of stopping a medication? What's the evidence of stopping the medication? What's the risk of continuing the medication? So really having that shared decision-making is helpful. And then starting the process of stop one medication at a time, and if needed, develop a taper schedule. And I've already referred to Sam's talks you know, over the last month or so, but he talked about this as well, that a lot of CNS meds should be tapered. Halving the dose for a week to two, halving it again, and then stopping it should be done probably with other classes of medications. I think of cardiovascular meds, sometimes PPIs. It's difficult for some patients to stop those. But that's really important is to develop a schedule, do one med at a time, and coordinate with the pharmacy. So the problem is that if you tell the patient, I want you to stop this beta blocker and reduce the dose by half you know, for the next few weeks, the patient may still have refills on that beta blocker at the pharmacy, and it may be on a refill or an autofill and the patient may have five refills, or they may call the pharmacy and say, I need my medications refills. Well, which ones? I don't know, all of them. If the pharmacy doesn't know they've stopped it, it's going to refill. So that coordination piece with the pharmacy really, really has to happen in order for this to be successful. And then have that follow-up plan for monitor assessment, how the patient's doing, any issues, re-emergence of disease, uh, or any other problems. And just wrapping this up, uh, again, I just wanted to thank Brian for this slide. It has a good summary and link outs to the BEERS criteria, the stop start criteria. Again, those are nice toolkits to have to support and provide education for yourself as well as staff. The Liverpool Drug Interaction Checker is one that we use quite frequently in the HIV world. And again, I think the, the most important part is, is teamwork. As providers, I know you have sometimes 15, 20 minutes, maybe with a patient, 10 probably at most, and you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Well, this is where stewardship and teamwork, you know, there's, I'm sure there's an eager pharmacy student waiting to get let off the hook to be able to go and do this, to get into a medication list, getting your pharmacy residents, getting pharmacists involved, really having that teamwork of people that are trained and skilled to get in and do this medication reconciliation and even through collaborative practice be able to do some of the deep prescribing potentially for you. So circling back to the patient and how I would generally approach this is I'd start with medication reconciliation and, and I lightly refer to this as pharmaceutical janitorial work, which really getting in and cleaning things up and cleaning up the medication list of identifying what the patient is really taking and what they're really not. It's important, I think, to, to contact the pharmacy and get a list of current medications. I would do this prior to this patient's um, visit. I would get the medication list and have either the student or myself or the nurse go over that first, um, reconcile those meds. At the visit, I would inquire about over-the-counter meds, herbals, recreational drugs. And one of the problems 
that some EMRs have is this auto import with the better communication between pharmacy records and electronic health records. Sometimes the dumping of prescriptions into the electronic health record can happen of any medication the patient has filled, and that creates more problems. If you have the opportunity having patient bring in their medications, or if you're doing telehealth, ask them to show you and line up their medications and go over them with you. Once we have done that, we review the medication and problem list. We go through those medication-related problems. We identify medications without indications, legacy, inappropriate dosing, things that need to be adjusted, and we'll review and look for beers, stop-start medications, and pull those off. And then ultimately have that shared decision-making and prioritizing stopping meds. And as we go back to the meds, some things that I would think about as I go through this medication list that I think about Alendronate, if this patient has been on Alendronate for five years, maybe it's time to have the conversation of trying time off of that. Citalopram, think about medications with added QT prolongation. I think about highest dose. I look at multiple cardiovascular meds. I think of those contributing to some of the dizziness and fuzziness. Famotidine, H2 blockers, I don't see an indication for that in his problem list. So I think about, can we get away from that? or is it being adjusted in renal disease as um, most H2 blockers should be? I think about the pain medications, are those being appropriately dosed? So these are things that I go through. I look at the ibuprofen, um, how often is he using it? Should we be using something else? He's already got a lot of other pain medications on board. And then I, again, we'll look at the problem list. I'll look at indications, medications that may not have an indication and review that with the provider as to, is it just that something got left off the problem list? Does the patient really have an indication for it? And then updating those aspects. And that's really it. Again, hoping that you know, you'll be able to take some of this information and, and have a better understanding of polypharmacy and its impacts on patient care, and ultimately taking some of those steps for creating a framework for you know, developing and honing your skills for prescribing, doing some medication reconciliation and, and deprescribing. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.